Is there a connection between churchmen attempting to bless same-sex couples with why so many Israelis feel no shame about committing genocide and why is the world tolerating it? I believe they are connected by Jewish perfidy. This is not a racial trait, it's a theological reality. Breaking the covenant with God, going against the faith. More importantly than all these, what simple measure can we take to help heal our societies from this globalist insanity and inhumanity? First of all, why is Bergoglio capitulating to the king of Sodom? Notice this article is from the New York Times. That is significant. We'll see later on. Luke Ford once asked the porn mogul Alvin Goldstein why Jews are so heavily overrepresented in producing pornography. Goldstein answered, the only reason that Jews are in pornography is that we think that, I don't want to say it, you can read it, and Catholicism sucks. We don't believe in authoritarianism. Pornography thus becomes a way of defiling Christian culture. Goldstein, who is so depraved about nature, is also blasphemously depraved about religion. He says, I believe in me. I'm God. I am the super being. I am your God. Admit it. This quote is recorded in the autobiography of Luke Ford, Another Jew. Where does this madness come from? There has always been sexual sin, and from all nations, indeed before the Jews even existed, so they're not the root of it. But in the 20th century, certain individuals and organizations were attempting to give a scientific justification for sexual depravity. It is not accidental that they were dominated by Jews. In If You Believe Moses, Volume 2, I mentioned three of them almost in passing. Magnus Hirschfeld, Felix Teilhaber, and Wilhelm Reich. Why is it that breaking the covenant with God leads to sins that cry out to heaven? The Times of Israel celebrates Magnus Hirschfeld as the Einstein of sex, whatever that's supposed to mean, and says 100 years ago he fought to decriminalize homosexuality, and under his photo it notes he was a German Jew in Berlin who pioneered what became the modern LBGTQ rights movement. He coined the word transvestite in his 1910 book, Transvestites, and wrote, each new truth destroys the one held before it. This is a totally false metaphysics, as if truth is at war with truth. It is one thing to advance in knowledge, building on what has been established. It's completely false to think truths destroy everything that came before. He writes, the jolting results collapse upon one another when the foundation is shaken, the one upon which they were supported. This shaking of the foundations he applies to government, tradition, society and religion. You wonder why the world seems to be falling apart. This metaphysics of devastation comes from Satan, which is hinted at in the last highlighted quote on the page. Masculine and feminine are the alpha and omega of higher substances. In other words, they owe their origins and features to the masculine and feminine principles. This confusion about masculine and feminine principles comes from a rejection of what God has revealed in Genesis and through the Gospels. Masculine and feminine represent the divine and the created. The first is the fullness of being, self-subsistent being. God is the reason for his own existence. And the second is creation, which depends entirely upon the creator. It is entirely contingent. It is not a principle which can be put in equality with God. And yet this is what Kabbalah tries to do with being and non-being, as if these two are equals, two gods fighting it out. Whereas actually, non-being is just that. It's non-being. It's not the principle of anything. It can't give form to anything. It doesn't exist. The claim that it is a first principle is a lie of Satan, who, unable to steal God's place, wants to drag God down in the hearts of humans so that he, Satan, the king of Sodom, can rule over and oppress humans, pervert us from our calling to God.
And where does this theological and metaphysical confusion lead Hirschfeld and those who follow him and a society that celebrates him? Here is a photo of a party at the Institute for Sexual Science, which he founded. The caption says Hirschfeld is second from the right, the one with the moustache and glasses. His partner, Karl Giese, is holding his hand. And there are so many things wrong with this photo, I don't need to say a word about it. Another pioneer of making depravity mainstream was Felix Aaron Teilhaber. He began publishing in Germany before World War I, his bizarre theories on sexuality, and as these developed, so did his ideas on Zionism. So you see, with World War II, he's promoting these ideas, and the two are connected, because if one rejects the natural law and opts for perversion, then the intellect is darkened, the heart is covered with a veil, and one cannot understand what God is saying about the true Israel and the true promised land and the heavenly Jerusalem. So one has a this-worldly materialistic understanding of it, which we see cannot work out, inevitably is going to end in genocide. The third figure we look at is Wilhelm Reich, a Jew of Vienna who in his 1935 book The Sexual Revolution dismisses what he calls a biologistic view that the sexual drive exists for the preservation of the species. This is something that the Greeks understood was true, and anyone with common sense has understood is true. But he rejects it because he says it is a finalistic and thus idealistic view which presupposes a goal. Again, this is Satan's lie, saying there is no telos, no goal to creation, which is God. And so you will hear philosophers of the last 300 years rejecting anything that speaks of final causes, which again, even Aristotle said the final cause is the same as the efficient cause. The end of all things is the beginning of all things, that the God who creates is the God to whom things tend. But Wilhelm Reich, in his insanity, he dismisses this as it reintroduces, he writes, a metaphysical principle, therefore fundamentally it has a religious or mystical bias and he hates religion. He launches an assault against marriage, saying the only reason the sexual relationship can last is because of economic inequality, that the man is exploiting the woman. And this will help us understand why economic Marxism is tied in with cultural Marxism. He then rejects that children are the first end of marriage. He says here it's claimed that they're the essence of marriage but he says, no, it's the sexual relationship which is the essence. Here you see the beginning of the church's decision in the 1983 Code of Canon Law to invert the ends of marriage, where the church no longer stressed what had always been taught, that children are the first end of marriage and the bond or perfection of the spouses is the second end. That is no longer so explicit in the 1983 Code of Canon Law. Why did the church do this? because she's listening to the world, because she's following the Jews who reject the covenant with God. You will hear many commentators today criticizing Marxism or wokeism, but they don't know or they're too afraid to trace this back to the Jewish rejection of the covenant with God. So Wilhelm Reich writes, in Russian communism, the economic revolution during the first years paralleled the revolution in sexual life. Without an appreciation of the sexual process in the Soviet Union, its cultural process cannot be understood. It is catastrophic when leaders of a revolutionary movement try to defend reactionary Philistine views. Basically, he wants total revolution. Reich spent his life laboring to bring Satan's rebellion from hell onto earth. So he has a chapter on the abolition of the family saying the sexual revolution in the Soviet Union began with the dissolution of the family. The patriarchal family is the structural and ideological breeding ground of all social orders based on the authoritarian principle. He's correct that the family is the principle of order in society, and this patriarchy ultimately comes from God the Father. But just as Satan is in rebellion against God, so are these who serve him. 
He continues, the disintegration of the compulsory family was an expression of the fact that human sexual needs broke the chains imposed on them by economic and authoritarian family ties. He perceives an imposition of tyranny where there is none. The natural order of the family is to him a tyranny and authoritarianism. That something so good and true and of God cannot just fall apart by natural forces. Natural forces make it stronger, bring it out more. So why is it falling apart in our world? Because men like Willem Reich have been channeling Satan, channeling his rebellion. It is not enough to say this is woke or Marxist. To understand it, we need to go to metaphysical and theological principles. Then we have a chance to understand why Francis is capitulating to the king of Sodom. Reich did a lot for the legalization of contraception and homosexuality. You know the paedophiles want to take your children. There is a link between paedophilia and the divorce that the Jews demanded Moses allow, which was not God's mind. It was not how it was in the beginning, and it's not how Jesus taught. Jesus' teaching is that a sacramental marriage is indissoluble. And they said, why then did Moses allow divorce? And Jesus replied, it was not so from the beginning, but because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed divorce. This means that according to the natural law, to nature, to God's creation, divorce has no part in it. And when Jesus raised marriage to a sacrament, this is to make unassailable the truth about his relationship with his bride, the church. It can never, ever be broken. And there is no other. He has only one bride. And that bride includes members from both the New Testament and the Old Testament. But those who, in the day of Moses, they heard the law given through Moses from God, and they came and lobbied and petitioned for the right to divorce. And Moses granted it because he's only a human being. He's not the son of God. He's not the divine redeemer. He doesn't have the strength to resist this godless lobbying of the world and the devil. Only Jesus did that perfectly and has given that power to the church if she chooses to follow him. See what happens, though, when the church follows the world. Because after you allow divorce, the thinking is that it's their primarily marriage for the spouses. And when they're unhappy, they can forget the good of their children and separate, which devastates children. And if that's accepted, then the next step is contraception. Because if marriage is not about children, if the first end is not to procreate, if it's more about the union or happiness of the spouses, then why not allow contraception if they don't want children? And then abortion is permitted because children are seen as a threat to the lifestyle and happiness of the spouses. But if this is accepted, then so is gay marriage. Because if children are not the end of marriage, if it's just about the pleasure and supposed happiness of the spouses, then why do you need a man and a woman? If children aren't the end of marriage, why do you need the difference of the sexes? If it's just about the supposed bond of a couple of people. Yet if nature and God are rejected and the complementarity of the spouses, then why not transgender? What does it mean anyway to say two men or two women? Why not have a gender spectrum? And then why not transgender for children, seeing as they're so despised that they can be murdered in the womb anyway? Why not mutilate their sexual organs so they can't procreate themselves? This, this state of hell is a descendant of divorce, which those Jews lobbied Moses to allow because they didn't want to open their hard hearts to the word of God. So you have heroic and saintly Jews like Moses and Abraham and David, and the graces for the world are immeasurable when we follow these. But when the world is tied up in usury by the bankers, when she serves mammon, when Protestants reject Catholic teaching, and when Catholics are infatuated with Protestants and the world and the king of Sodom, they will fall into the trap laid by those pioneering Jewish sexologists. Here in 1935, Reich is saying, only when the responsibility for the rearing of children is assumed by the whole community can one contemplate explicit birth control and population policies. The Soviet government made every effort to penetrate the most remote regions of the Basque country because people in rural areas who are still in touch with nature 
resisted this legalization of homosexuality and this pushing of contraception. And this same program that was carried out 100 years ago in Russia is being pushed now by George Soros, continuing the work of Wilhelm Reich, who said the walls separating homosexuals from society were to be torn down. Notice the footnote here. The official Soviet encyclopedia in its presentation on sexuality drew mainly from Magnus Hirschfeld and partly from Freud. Freud is another Jew who was impressed by Kabbalah. He infected Hirschfeld with this derangement and Reich is a student of them both and of the Soviet Union. He dismisses the traditional views on family and repugnance at homosexuality saying in all countries the petty bourgeois groups were still under the spell of sexual ascetic views and medieval prejudices. The disciplines to maintain chastity and the traditional teaching of the scholastics is dismissed here, out of hand with a modernistic hubris which is bringing hell on earth. This is where it ends with Reich wanting to sexually corrupt the small child. He writes of the sex affirmative upbringing of the child and a program of education to affirm infantile sexuality. This is stomach churning. He writes how teachers were prohibited from giving praise or blame as these are regarded as judgments that the child could not understand. This is a total fear and rejection of the last judgment. Turning reality on its head, he says that praise and blame only served to satisfy the teacher's ambition and self-esteem. With these few basic rules, the authoritarian principle was eliminated from education. They're trying to get rid of God. And likewise, they had to be very sparing with their affection and tenderness. The adults were strictly forbidden to indulge in emotional expressions of affection. Vera Schmidt emphasized quite correctly that such expressions of affection served the gratification of the adults more than the needs of the children. This is just bizarre. The, the man is psychotic and the world has gone after him. If you look him up on Wikipedia, which normally I wouldn't recommend, but in broad terms, it tells us about the errors of Russia, that he and his wife visited the Soviet Union in 1929 and that he returned even more convinced of the link between sexual and economic oppression and of the need to integrate Marx and Freud. Again, two more of Jewish background causing revolution and chaos at the different levels of society. And Wilhelm Reich trying to bring them together. This man who was convinced that the aliens were after him, that UFOs were chasing him. He was also a medical fraud. He had really bizarre theories in which he was imprisoned as a fraud and a lunatic. But in one tragic note, if you read here about his death, he had left instructions that there was to be no religious ceremony, but that a record should be played of Schubert's Ave Maria, sung by Marian Anderson. It seems he did know, have, he could recognize beauty. Was this some call to the mother of God for help? knowing that in the end, what else do we have? To whom else can we turn? Say a Hail Mary for his soul. Now, I've said this about other people who've tried to destroy the church. Please say a prayer for them. And I've had comments saying, you can't say this of public sinners. That's absolutely wrong. You can't have a mass said for them publicly. That's scandalous. But anyone can pray in private. We can say a prayer for Wilhelm Reich or for Felix Talhaber, or for Magnus Hirschfeld. God knows they need prayers. And if those men are in hell already, then the prayers aren't wasted. The merits and the graces will be assigned by heaven to someone else more in need or more deserving. And all these men need prayers. What's basically gone wrong is that Francis and many in the hierarchy are not listening to Christ and the Apostles, not listening to tradition and the deposit of faith, but they're listening to the world and to the prince of this world. They're listening to Jews who have broken the covenant with God. What does Abraham show us there in Genesis 14? 
We read first of true worship and then Abraham rejecting the world and false worship. It says, Melchizedek, the king of Salem, bringing forth bread and wine, for he was the priest of the Most High God, blessed Abraham. So here you have the king of Salem, the king of peace, representing Jesus Christ, the eternal high priest, with bread and wine, which is a prefiguration of the Holy Eucharist and Holy Mass in there being offered to the Most High God, and the blessing of Abraham by one who's greater than Abraham. And the fact that Melchizedek stands for the eternal priesthood is manifested in time through history by keeping tradition. That is one expression of eternity. But in contrast to this, see verse 21, the king of Sodom said to Abraham, so we've had the king of Salem, true king of peace, and now in contrast, the king of Sodom said to Abraham, give me the persons and the rest take to thyself. So he's saying, da mihi animas, anima is the soul. Give me the souls, but you can have the booty, the spoils of war, the riches, the goods of this world. But Abraham replies, I will not take of any of the things that are thine, lest thou say I have enriched Abraham. Abraham wouldn't give him any of the persons, wouldn't hand over souls to the king of Sodom. He didn't want any of the riches or the spoils that the world could offer him. He's there like a good shepherd to protect the souls entrusted to him, protect those he went and rescued. But Francis is handing souls over to Satan, as is Cardinal Fernandez, as is Father Martin. For what? They say that these attempts to give blessings to same-sex couples are about pastoral care. But this is not pastoral. The pastor, the good shepherd, who's willing to lay down his life, wants to give the sheep good pasture, which means the truth. He wants to protect them from the lions and the bears and the wolves, which means to protect them from the lies of the Marxists and the Hirschfields and the Judaizers. The good shepherd wants to bring the sheep into the sheepfold before night falls. That means to bring them into a state of grace before they die so they come into heaven. And so if two homosexuals come asking for a blessing, the first thing the pastor should say to them, seeing the situation, is do you believe in God? You'd think so because they've come to a priest. And do you believe in heaven and hell? Because if not, they need to be convinced of it. Do they believe that there are grave sins? Do they believe that sodomy is a sin which cries out to heaven? And if they don't believe this, this is what the conversation needs to be about before there's any conversation about a blessing. Because to attempt to bless them is bene dicere, to say something is good. Bene is good, dicere is to speak. As God says his creation is good, if you try to bless a same-sex couple coming as a couple, you're lying to them about what is good. But for the homosexuals who want God, who want to come to heaven, they generally don't come to priests in Paris. They come alone and ask for teaching, ask for help, or they come to confession, seeking grace. And all those that do so sincerely will be helped by God. He doesn't desire the death of a sinner. It's the unrepentant that go the way of fire and brimstone. Why have these clerics paid no heed to what St. Paul writes in Romans 1? Those who turn away from God and give themselves over to homosexuality St. Paul writes, are foolish, dissolute, without affection, without fidelity. Remember that, it means without faithfulness. Who, having known the justice of God, did not understand that they who do such things are worthy of death. This is a spiritual death, a sentence that leads to hell. And not only they that do them, but they also that consent to them that do it. So it is not only the Sodomites who are in trouble here, but the clerics who bless it or the bishops who say that such a blessing is possible. They're going to get the same eternal punishment if they do not repent. Now that we should have hell on earth through rejecting God's covenant is becoming very apparent in the Holy Land. Here is footage of northern Gaza. The Jews have no right to Palestine. What their so-called settlers have been doing for decades, the IDF, is now doing on a terrible scale. And it is all of one piece with the bribery and lies and terrorism and manipulation of foreign governments and war, which the Zionists used up to 1948 to secure the state of Israel. 
they have no right to this land and America cannot bestow it. And before that, England and France don't have the right, no matter what laws they write up, no matter how they corrupt the international order. Zionism is a rejection of God's sentence that the Jews would be without land unless they accept the faith, accept the new covenant, and inherit the whole world in the church and thereby inherit heaven. God gave the Holy Land to the Hebrews for a very specific purpose, which is true worship, and they definitively rejected this at the crucifixion. The Catholic Church's position on Zionism was given more than 100 years ago with perfect clarity by Pope St. Pius X. The Pope said, we are unable to favour this movement of Zionism. We cannot prevent the Jews from going to Jerusalem, but we could never sanction it, never. The ground of Jerusalem, if it were not always sacred, has been sanctified by the life of Jesus Christ. As the head of the church, I cannot answer you otherwise. The Jews have not recognized our Lord, therefore we cannot recognize the Jewish people. And so if you come to Palestine and settle your people there, we will be ready with churches and priests to baptize all of you. St. Pius X shows here that the church does not reduce herself to politics. She doesn't dream of picking up arms, but she should be ever ready with the gospel and the sacraments to welcome the Jews into the church when they hear God's call to conversion. The only alternative to worshipping the true God is to descend into a murderous inhumanity. Here, the US Secretary of State, Madeleine Albright, was asked about the half a million Iraqi children who had died as a result of the UN embargo. We have heard that a half a million children have died. I mean, that's more children than died when, when, in, in Hiroshima. And, and, you know, is the price worth it? I think this is a very hard choice, but the price, we think the price is worth it. Is it significant that the Secretary of State Albright was Jewish, or that before her, Henry Kissinger, who's responsible for millions of deaths, was Jewish, or that now another Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, is Jewish, who's facilitating the genocide in Gaza, while Biden stands in the background making himself nobody? And this is not to blame the Jews for all the problems in the world, because clearly Bush and Biden are not Jewish, but they go along with those ideas which have their roots in a rejection of the covenants brought by Abraham, Moses, and the new and eternal covenant of Jesus Christ. And of course, it's not just Americans who went along with this. Tony Blair, though he made some apologies for the Iraq war, said he would do it all again. And all those fools in England who supported him, I'm one of them. I believed Blair and I supported the Iraq war. Now, the guilt of us who supported Blair is mostly fairly remote, but we will carry it to the grave if we do not repent of it and if we do not now oppose what is happening in Gaza in our prayers, in our conversation and in the opportunities we have to say no to this globalist world and globalist agenda and if we will not oppose the atrocities that are happening now in Palestine we will be party also if there is an escalation if the psychopaths in New York want to try and wipe out Iran it is at least becoming easier and easier to spot the lies listen here to the mayoress of Jerusalem she begins this segment saying I did see the report and very shortly after contradicts herself saying, I did not see the report. And pretty much everything she says between and after is also a lie. I don't, I saw the report this morning. Um, the church, there are no churches in Gaza, so I'm not quite sure where the report well, is, 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 is talking a, there's about. There's a Catholic church in there, isn't there? That is. Yeah, unfortunately, there are no Christians because they were dry, dro drove, driven out. By well, there somebody. are respectfully there are Christians because I spoke to an MP yesterday who has family members in the church who are Christians. Well, I don't uh, know what happened. I wrong. don't know who was attacked. I didn't see the report, but the prop. Almost everything she says here is false. 
Besides the tragic injustices being committed on a massive scale against Muslim Palestinians here, and by Muslims on a smaller scale against the Jews, there's also a real threat of the extinction of Christians in Gaza, and then perhaps even the Holy Land. How is this possible? Well, listen a few more moments to this confusion. Because people have very little historical context. And the Nazis also used this defense, the Dresden defense. Oh, well, the British killed so many innocent Germans. It's okay that we started the war and we killed all those innocent people. It's a big, big difference legally and morally between unintentional killing in the middle of a horrible war that we didn't want and we didn't okay. start and the deliberate yeah. killing of innocent civilians. The brainwashing of Zionists enabling such inhumanity is tied in with a false notion of near universal anti-Semitism. That is a projection. Just look in your heart. Do you hate Jews? My guess is no, you don't. If you're watching this video, if you're Catholic, I don't think so. But Jewish children are specifically told that the world hates them and wants to murder them. School kids are taken from Israel to Poland to Auschwitz and given programs to teach them that all the locals there even today hate them and are dangerous and they need to watch out constantly for attacks. This is a projection from inside the Jews who believing that they're the chosen race called by God to dominate the world and that they have the right to wipe out nations which oppose them or get in their way, especially in the Holy Land, have no idea how their behavior distresses the people in the countries that they share. So even Jewish scholars admit that a lot of the pogroms against Jews in the past have been nothing to do with anti-Semitism, but everything to do with economic and political exploitation. When Jews have got the upper hand through usury, financially, or when in political power they use that to serve the interests of the Jewish people before that of the nation they're in, then there is a resentment which breaks out often in violence. Not because the people doing these things are Jewish, it's because they're doing them. And the world is letting Israel commit genocide, in part because of a massive lie about the Holocaust. Now, the Holocaust is real. An uncountable number of Jews suffered unspeakably and were murdered under the Nazis. This is one of the most grotesque things that has ever happened in the world. Yet if you believe the Holocaust was mainly caused by anti-Semitism, then you're a victim also of a huge propaganda lie. The very lie which is causing Israelis to go berserk right now. If this channel survives, I can make much more detailed videos about this in the future. Meanwhile, there's a chapter from if you believe Moses volume two called the weaponization of the Holocaust narrative. It's available now as a podcast with a link in the description below, or you can get the whole audio book. It's also linked below as are the print and ebook versions. The book tries to show why this is a theological matter. It's ultimately a question about Jesus Christ and the crucifixion. So one might try to distinguish between Zionist and non-Zionist Jews, but that isn't going to solve ultimately the problems. So for example, you have Professor Jeffrey Sachs, who on the question of what's happening now in Gaza, he's speaking so much truth, so much good sense, yet he is not bringing us one inch closer to a solution because he can't speak the truth about Jesus Christ, who is the savior of the world. And the alternatives which Professor Sachs will offer are about diplomacy, and international law. These have their place, but without Jesus Christ, they're going to serve the Antichrist's global totalitarianism. To the Middle East, do you see any uh, let up in the slaughter of Gazans, the indiscriminate slaughter of civilians by the Israeli forces? Well, qu quite the contrary. We see an intensification of mass murder, basically, war crimes committed every day, and the Israelis uh, saying that they're going to extend the war into Lebanon. Uh, all of this depends uh, daily on U.S. munitions. Uh, Israel cannot do this uh, other than with the U.S. Uh, as a direct partner. This is not the U.S. giving a green light or the U.S. blocking vetoes in the U.N. This is the U.S. as a direct partner every day 
in the munitions needed to kill people massively. Again, unbelievable. Uh, and it's all done, uh, again, on so many false pretenses. And it's a mass murder. Uh, the Center for Constitutional Rights uh, in New York, a legal think tank, uh, has uh, uh, enabled a group of Palestinians to file a lawsuit uh, in U.S. federal court charging a U.S. government complicity in genocide. And if one goes to the website of the Center for Constitutional Rights, uh, you find an extremely detailed uh, set of uh, briefs, first the first complaint and now a follow-up brief, documenting the genocidal intent and actions of the Israeli government. And the U.S. is party to this. It has no possible successful endpoint, by the way. It, there's no possible successful endpoint because it's based on a fundamentally impossible political idea, which is the Netanyahu government's political idea that Israel is going to dominate the entire region, uh, the West Bank, East Jerusalem, Gaza, on a permanent basis. That's right. the political idea. It's impossible because there can never be peace on that basis. And May God reward Professor Sachs for saying truly that the Netanyahu government's aim here is to make Gaza uninhabitable because they want to steal this land for themselves and then the West Bank and then even parts of Lebanon and Syria and elsewhere because this has been the declared policy of the Likud party for decades and the Zionists to achieve a greater Israel. And the world is standing back and watching it happen. Why? I think because of Mammon, because of the banks, because of usury. We can understand why Iran is cautious to act because there are psychopaths like Lindsey Graham who want to flatten Iran and will not just look for an excuse but will create one to do it. But other countries like Saudi Arabia is being very slow to be roused and Turkey despite the rhetoric also very fearful to act and my guess is that it's because the leaders around the world are so tied in with the banking system they dare not risk losing everything in order to defend the Palestinians. And I think that the tragedy of this is that when action might come, it is also going to be so disproportional as the Israelis are reacting disproportionately against Hamas, killing over 20,000 Palestinians so far. So in this godless logic of revenge and murder, if the Arab world does retaliate against Israel, it is going to be worse than anything the world has seen in 2000 years. Professor Sachs rightly said, there's no successful outcome to this policy of the Zionists. See, of course, it is a problem that the Israeli prime minister and the president and the defense minister are openly calling for genocide. The deeper problem is the Jewish rejection of Jesus Christ. King of the Jews, King of Kings. So while it should be obvious that what Netanyahu is doing is from hell, so also what Professor Sachs advocates is a road to nowhere. When he says there's no possible positive outcome to this policy, there's a danger then that the solution the world goes for is a one world government. And this has been advocated by very influential Jews for more than 100 years, that Jerusalem should be the world capital, having a police force to enforce their laws and a shrine for all the prophets for a one world religion. So if you can't get peace in the Holy Land between Muslims and Jews, and if it leads to a genocide which the world cannot ignore, then are we going to hear for an international body to own and control the Holy Land and from there control the whole world. This is the mad dream of the Antichrist. And while I can believe that Professor Sachs's motivations are good, the fact that he discounts Jesus Christ and the veracity of the Bible leaves that as the inevitable alternative. Uh, this is an attempt stated by the Israelis, although we don't want to hear it, so we try not to hear the actual words that are used, but to make Gaza uninhabitable. And that's that's got a purpose that also needs to be understood. Israel is not fighting Hamas. Israel is fighting for a greater Israel, which is a, 
a kind of messianic biblical idea uh, that uh, now is in political ascendancy in Israel, that Israel has the right to control all of the area. It has the right to control the millions and millions of Palestinians because there's some uh, zealots that believe and they are powerful right now. God said so in the book of Joshua sometime around the fifth century BC. And you can't really make this up because this is 21st century stuff and right. it's devastating. And this is what we're siding with. I don't think Americans really understand what is motivating the Israelis. I don't think Americans understand the risk of this war widening very significantly, very dangerously, and very fast. But this is what we're up against. And unfortunately, we have a president who's not effectively a president. I don't know what he is, but uh, it's it's the worst foreign policy imaginable right now. And Summarizing here, Zionism is unjustifiable. It cannot be justified politically, cannot be justified from the Bible. But even those Jews who reject Zionism, if they reject Jesus Christ, they will leave people casting about for a solution and we will find that the one world government is offered as the only solution. And this is the antithesis of Christ. It's antichrist versus Christ. There is a very dangerous contradiction in the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance carrying the slogan, a world that remembers the Holocaust, a world without genocide. It is precisely the insistence of a distorted Holocaust narrative which has led us to the current genocide. It's because discussion of the Holocaust is forbidden that so many people are standing back and letting the current genocide happen. The IHRA has been lobbying internationally to have nations sign up to what they say is a non-binding definition on anti-Semitism, but the longer term purpose that it is criminalized to fall under what they define saying Anti-Semitism is a certain perception of Jews. This is truly leading to thought police and mind control by shutting down conversation. The way to guarantee something worse than the Holocaust is to forbid a discussion of history. It's to put out a falsity about that. To claim that the main cause of it was anti-Semitism, which is false, and to not allow the true roots of the Holocaust to be identified is going to lead to something worse. Taking a closer look at what they are attempting to criminalize in due course, which is already achieved in some countries. But they start with something very reasonable and true. They say calling for aiding or justifying the killing or harming of Jews in the name of a radical ideology or an extremist view of religion. Now it's quite right to condemn that, even criminalize it. And yet that is already done because it's wrong to murder anyone. But it's a way of drawing us into the next part, making stereotypical allegations about Jews or the power of Jews as a collective, such as especially but not exclusively the myth about a world Jewish conspiracy or of Jews controlling the media, economy, government or other social institutions. Can we not talk about this? when we've seen what Kissinger and then Albright and then Blinken are guilty of? And at the top of page 7, denying the fact, scope, mechanisms, e.g. gas chambers of the World War II Holocaust. But how can it be criminal to deny the scope or the mechanisms? Who decides what the scope and the mechanisms are? And how can there be a decision without discussion, discussion of people who disagree? The point underneath it is to be criminalized in due course for accusing the Jews as a people or Israel as a state of inventing or exaggerating the Holocaust. Now, the Holocaust happened, but it has certainly been exaggerated. Next, accusing Jewish citizens of being more loyal to Israel or to the alleged priorities of Jews worldwide than to the interests of their own nation. Has this never happened, that it should be a crime to say that it's happened and that it's happening today? Denying the Jewish people their right to self-determination, e.g. by claiming that the existence of a state of Israel is a racist endeavor. There's no more racist state on the planet than Israel. Its very basis is race, to make a Jewish state. Uh, this is conflated with a Jewish right to self-determination and leaves no room for the theological discussion of the curse that fell upon Cain for murdering his brother 
that he had to wander. The same which God has visited on the Jews. Of course, people think I'm wrong for saying that. Then let it be discussed. But if you're criminalizing it, we're criminalizing truth. We're criminalizing what has been the teaching of the church for centuries, for millennia, which is what this struggle is all about. It is from the Antichrist. There's another point there, using the symbols and images associated with classic anti-Semitism, e.g. claiming of Jews killing Jesus or of blood libel. You can't do this to characterize Israel or Israelis. It's true that the guilt for the crucifixion is not inherited by race. No one's guilty of the crucifixion because their ancestors 2,000 years ago plotted for it, organized it, and achieved it. But when you make a decision of will, once having reached the age of reason, and you decide that considering the crucifixion, you don't side with the crucified, you reject the Lamb of God, but you say that those Caiaphas and Anas and the Sanhedrin, who pushed Pilate to execute him, you say, I identify with them. They are my leaders. They are the representatives of my religion. That's when you voluntarily choose to associate yourselves with the crucifiers. Now, all who have sinned are guilty of the crucifixion, but Christians, we repent our sin. We say sorry to God. But those who dismiss the murder of Jesus, who are disinterested, not bothered by it, they are making their own choice. And it is not anti-Semitic to recognize this, as the church has done for 2,000 years until she started listening to the prince of this world. To jump to the last highlighted point, anti-Semitic discrimination is the denial to Jews of opportunities or services available to others and is illegal in many countries. And yet this is the basis of the church's medieval policy of Sikhet Judaeus. It's the only policy that seems to work between Jews and Christians. And it's the only way that Christendom can survive and grow. There has to be discrimination. And yet it is no injustice. But for more detail on that, please read the book. The International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance point out this is a non-legally binding definition of anti-Semitism, but despite protestations, the aim is to make it legally binding as far and wide as possible. And it is already effective. My book has been banned by Amazon without any process, and the time will come when we cannot talk about these things. Bear in mind that their definition wants to forbid a theological discussion wants to forbid what has been long Catholic teaching and wants us to call what is judicious and just Catholic policy, it wants us to condemn that as anti-Semitic. So it's important to talk now and act now so that we accumulate the capital of grace necessary, the strength and understanding in the church to survive those dark days at the end, or if not us, the future generation that has to. We have our part to play now. And it is not to give in to this darkness and tyranny while we still have a chance to write, speak and discuss and together find the truth. In opposition to this, who is promoting this definition of anti-Semitism? Well, it's coming from New York. Uh, it must be something to do with Mammon. Behind this pamphlet is the American Jewish Committee. It's called the American Jewish Committee. But since their founding, they've had a global vision. And so they acknowledge that here with global Jewish advocacy to advance their program around the world. They call it human rights. It's not. It's Antichrist. And their work is posted there on the website of the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights. This is the most elaborate Trojan horse ever built. And it's the devil that's inside of it. In case it is not already clear, this video is not about blaming Jews alone for all the problems in the world. All of us have sinned. All nations have their part in war, in pornography and family breakdown, in usury and debt. But it is on a spiritual level that Jews have a global effect when they reject the Messiah, as well as a globally beneficial effect when they accept Jesus Christ. 
the point of the video is that the church should not avoid teaching about this. Now to summarize the three themes of this video so far, the world and the church will suffer from the perfidy of the Jews, especially where we voluntarily follow them. Perfidy means to go against the faith. And the Jews reject not only the faith of the New Testament, but also the Old Testament, because it's the same faith. There is one faith, anticipated in the Old and fully revealed in the New. But it's one and the same, for Abraham and Moses had faith in Jesus Christ. They believed in his coming. And there is a continuity in the perfidy, the rejection of faith, of those who murdered the prophets, those who murdered Christ, and those who seek to murder the church, to silence her and set her aside. None of us need to follow them. Instead, we have a remedy in tradition, which is so packed full of goods that the church is supplied for every want and need on her journey. God knew in advance what the church would face, and so he's made sure that tradition contains, as it were, every medicine she would need in case of sickness, or every weapon in the face of combat, or every amount of treasure to acquire the spiritual goods and graces to overcome. And so here in the Missal is the ancient prayer for the conversion of the Jews prayed every Good Friday. Twice the prayer describes the Jews as perfidious. We will see in a moment why this is so important. But in 1959, John the 23rd removed both those references. In the middle, you see the rubric that instructs the priest and the people present not to genuflect in the midst of this prayer, as with all the other great intercessions. That is to say, there is a genuflection in the other great intercessions, but traditionally no genuflection here. Then in 1955, Pope Pius XII inserted a genuflection. Very soon after this, the American Jewish Committee were thanking the Vatican for doing what their forerunners had long been lobbying for. Because it is not enough for them to reject Jesus Christ, they cannot bear either that we pray to him properly inside our churches that we worship him properly. This to them is felt like a sting and an accusation, a prick of conscience, and they want us to be silent. If we are silent, we'll all be damned. So let's look at tradition. What does it mean by using the word perfidy? This is a breach of faith or trust, base treachery. The breach of faith is that faith God calls us to through the word of God announced by the prophets, and fully revealed in his son. The base treachery is having the king of kings executed. This etymology says is from the Latin perfidia, meaning faithlessness, falsehood, or treachery, from the phrase perfidem decipere, to deceive through trustingness. It's specifically that one is expecting a trust and the betrayal comes. It fits perfectly with Judas, but also to those Jews of the Sanhedrin who are entrusted with leading the people to the Messiah and instead led the people to call for him to be crucified. This is the very exhibition of perfidy. Breaking down the word, the first part, per, has a range of meanings, the last of which in the list given here is against. The fide part, they trace back to the Greek pistis, which is the word used for our theological faith in God, and in Latin, fides, meaning trust or faith, belief. And therefore, putting the two together, perfidious is faithless or more properly against the faith. It's baseless treachery. It's from those who are expected to have it. So Moses received the faith. Abraham received the faith. Jacob and Isaac received it. Countless Hebrews received the faith and Jews after them. And they've done immeasurable good for the world in bringing us Christ before or after he came. But others rejected him, were perfidious. And it's for these that the church prays on Good Friday that they convert. And the alarm bells ought to ring when so great a Pope as Pius XII 
changes that ancient rubric and says we should genuflect here, though that's associated with a mockery of Jesus. And four years later, John the Twenty Third removes the word perfidious because he doesn't trust tradition but is frightened to offend the Jews. That's the same fear that is allowing the genocide now in Gaza. It's taking on board this lie that the church is anti-Semitic and that she's guilty in her teaching and her gospels for attacks upon the Jews. So we need to change our scriptures, change our teaching, change our liturgy. This is a lie against God who is pure love and everything he has done is for salvation. Likewise, what the church has done and preserved in his name is for salvation. What churchmen do to please the world, to please the New York Times, to keep up with the zeitgeist is from hell. So is there a connection between churchmen advocating the blessing of homosexual couples, the genocide in Gaza, and the international inaction which tolerates this slaughter? I believe they are connected by Jewish perfidy. Again, this is not a racial trait, it is a theological reality, breaking the covenant with God, going against the faith. Why does Francis serve the king of Sodom? Because he is looking to the world and not to God. He doesn't trust tradition, what Jesus and the apostles gave in the deposit of faith, but he thinks we can invent a new salvation. Why do so many Israelis feel no shame about committing genocide? Because the church is not teaching publicly and openly the truth about the chosen people and the promised land. The chosen people are everyone who accepts Jesus Christ as Lord and the promised land is heaven. There's nothing on this earth will do. That which they understand as the promised land is a figure, a representation, and it passes away as this whole world will pass away. What God wants to give us is not something that we murder our neighbour to grasp, but a paradise of angels and saints and the beatific vision forever. Why does the world tolerate the killing of the Palestinians? Because the leaders are slaves to the banks, to Mammon. And that's a challenge to all of us, to make sure that God is our only God and nothing in this world comes between us. While the leaders of various nations are slaves of the banks, we can say many in the populations are frightened of being called anti-Semitic. In most cases, this accusation is untrue. It's a contradiction anyway. The Palestinians are largely Semites. The Arabs are Semites. The Arameans are Semites. There are Ethiopians who are Semites. Who's accusing us of hating all these, especially when we defend the Palestinians? Anti-Semitic is, in the most part, it's a projection of the unjustifiable superiority that Jews feel over other people and bearing that in their hearts. Of course they suspect the worst in everyone else because they think that we think as they do. We don't because Jesus Christ sets us free from these errors, from this chauvinism and pride, from this ego and selfishness. Not by our power, because we all had plenty of that when we were children, but by his grace he will draw us out of it. And finally, the fourth question, what simple measure can we take to heal our societies from the global insanity? Well, the Good Friday Liturgy, prayed traditionally, is a start. On its own, it cannot fix everything, but without it, we will not be able to fix anything. Please God, if we hunger for truth and are courageous, then the church will once again be a city on a hill to illumine the whole world with Christ. God bless you all.